Good evening. Welcome to the Human Rights Campaign's Membership Town Hall. My name is Christopher Sperron. I'm the Senior Vice President of Development and Membership at the Human Rights Campaign, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in right now. Um, there are a lot of important topics happening uh, for LGBTQ plus people in our country right now, and we're all reflecting on the uh, tremendous impact of the Dobbs decision and um, the uh, relevance to the LGBTQ community and why it's important for you to know what this means and how it impacts you and people in our community. Um, we're calling this our summer of outrage, and we really need as many people as possible to be engaged in our work now more than ever. Um, we have a full program today, and we're excited to have some really terrific experts who are going to keep you informed and up to date on what's happening right now. To kick us off, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce Joni Madison, who is the uh, interim president of the Human Rights Campaign. Um, prior to joining uh, the Human Rights Campaign, Joni was one of our amazing volunteer leaders across the country, and she has served as the Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff at HRC since 2016. Um, right now, she's leading the organization, and we're thrilled to have her here today so you can hear from her on this work. So please take it away, Joni. Thank you, Chris. As Chris mentioned, my name is Joni Madison. My pronouns are she, her, hers and I am the interim president of the Human Rights Campaign. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight at our HRC member town hall. And I wanna thank you for being a part of our HRC family. We have a incredible event for you tonight with some great subject matter experts and activists who will talk about the overturn of Roe, its impact on our community and how we can fight back. First, I'd like to kick us off by providing a brief overview of where we are and what comes next. The Roe decision came down when I was very young, and this decision has definitely shaped the course of my life. For me and for so many of us, Roe has never been about abortion access alone. It's about our ability to make choices as women and LGBTQ plus people about our bodies and about our futures. It was and is about freedom about autonomy, about our power to define ourselves for ourselves. And now after the leaked decision came out in Dobbs a few months ago, intellectually, I was prepared for us to lose, but nothing could prepare me for how I would feel the day the decision came down. Frankly, I was shattered, I was shocked, and I was mad as hell. This decision is going to harm is already harming millions of women and LGBTQ plus people. The most vulnerable, particularly black people and other people of color are paying the heaviest price. And this decision is going to embolden anti-equality leaders to come for our hard won progress. I am mad as hell and I know I'm not alone. So many of you have reached out to share your anger, your pain, and over the past few weeks, so many of you have been turning your outrage into action, taking to the streets in protest. The day the Dobbs decision came down, I joined coalition leaders and thousands of folks from DC at a rally near the US Capitol. That day, as I looked out to that crowd and with folks from all backgrounds, identities, age groups, I was reminded then what I know to be true now. When we come together, we are powerful beyond imagination. We are relentless. We are strategic and we are unstoppable. We show up for one another because we are part of the human family and because justice perpetuates justice. Reproductive rights are LGBTQ plus rights. Women's rights are LGBTQ plus rights. Racial justice is LGBTQ plus justice. Disability justice is LGBTQ plus justice. We need each other to win and we have each other's backs. As you will hear more from folks in a minute, HRC is doing all that we can to support our communities in this dangerous and difficult moment. Many of you have been able to see and see our legal director, Sarah Warbelow, participate in a hearing on Dobbs in front of the House Judiciary Committee. We're going to show a few clips in a bit, including some back and forth with some of our worst opponents. Now, as you'll see, Representative Matt Gates may not know what being bisexual is, but the Matt Gates of this world do understand how strong we are as a united force. And that's precisely why they're going to try to divide us 
by pitting abortion rights against LGBTQ plus rights. Well, here's the thing. We're not going to take the bait because we understand that allowing someone to be themselves does not take away your own sense of identity, but instead ensures everyone is able to live authentically and with the same rights and protections as others. And we understand that inclusive language around issues such as abortion access and reproductive rights doesn't erase women. It highlights just how many people are impacted by Dobbs and by states attempting to roll back progress for all. To be clear, the attack on abortion access is part of a coordinated campaign to erode our foundational freedoms. They're attacking our trans and non-binary family, particularly our trans and non-binary kids. They're censoring our stories and identities and trying to stop us from having honest conversations about systemic injustice. These attacks are horrific and they're not stopping here. Our opponents are determined to tell us what we can learn, what we can say, how we can live and who we can be. And they're trying to take away our power to fight back at the ballot box. But here's the thing, we're never going to stop fighting for justice. Our community is not going anywhere. And we've got a mighty coalition behind us. In fact, we've got the majority of the American public on our side, including you. And we're squarely on the right side of history. We've got a vision of liberation where we're free to define ourselves for ourselves, where equity and equality are achieved, where everyone wins because everyone's connected. As an HRC family, we've all been working towards that vision for the last 40 plus years. We've had our share of heartbreak and loss, but we've also won victories and realized change that I never thought possible in my lifetime. So where do we go from here? You're going to hear more on that in just a minute. But I want to remind each of us, no one can take away our family. No one can take away our community. No one can take away our unity and no one can take away our vision of liberation. And we're going to keep putting in the work to bring that vision to life. We're going to vote for pro-equality candidates at every level of government. We're going to show up for our partners across movements, from Planned Parenthood and NARAL to local abortion funds. We're going to keep talking to all the people in our lives about what's at stake, how they can be involved, and how staying united has never been more important. Thank you. Now. I'd like to turn it back to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Joni. I really appreciate you giving us this great update. And you mentioned uh, one of our colleagues, Sarah Warblow, a few moments ago. And I'm thrilled that we have with us today HRC's legal director, Sarah Warblow. And um, many of you had a chance to see Sarah take on um, uh, members of Congress and really speak to these issues um, as she testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee um, last week. So uh, before we bring Sarah on, I'm going to turn it over to our friends in video world who are going to show a clip of Sarah in that moment. Would a 10-year-old choose to carry a baby? Um, I, I, I cannot. Do you think a 10-year-old should choose to carry a baby? I believe it would probably impact her, her life. And so therefore, it would fall under any exception and would not be an abortion. Wait, it would not be an abortion if a 10-year-old with her parents made the decision not to have a baby that was the result of a rape? If a 10-year-old became pregnant as a result of rape and it was uh, threatening her life, then that's not an abortion. So it would not fall under any abortion restriction in our nation. Ms. Warbelow, um, are you familiar with disinformation? Uh, yes, I am. Did you just hear some disinformation? Uh, yes, I heard some very significant disinformation. Why don't you tell me about uh, that? Yes, an, an abortion is a procedure. It's a medical procedure um, that individuals undergo for a wide range of circumstances, um, including uh, because they have been sexually assaulted, uh, raped in the case of the 10-year-old. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not um, there is a statutory exemption. It is still a medical procedure that is understood to be an abortion. Uh, beyond that, I think it's also important to note that there is no exception um, for the life or the health of the mother in the Ohio law. That's why that 10-year-old had to cross state lines in order to receive an abortion. You just saw how incredible Sarah is and what a powerful voice she is for our community. In her job, she leads uh, a team of lawyers that uh, take on um, challenges all across this country and help lead HRC's legal policy efforts. Please welcome um, HRC's legal director, Sarah Warbelow. 
Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. You know, um, Joni talked about the immediate impact of the Dobbs decision on LGBTQ folks. And I want to take a moment to talk about the threats that are to come. The majority opinion in Dobbs made absolutely clear that they did not see um, their decision as having impact on any other community or any other issue. But Justice Thomas, in his concurrence, made very clear that he welcomes challenges to a whole body of case law that sets our substantive due process rights. These are the rights that may not be enumerated in the Constitution, written out for all to see, but that we understand are critical rights for the American people, including the right to marry, the right to have uh, same-sex sexual intimate relationships, um, the right to access birth control. There are others that he did not mention, but if we follow his logic would also be on the chopping block, um, including the ability of parents to make uh, sound decisions on behalf of their children, like where to send them to school. Um, this call to action will absolutely motivate lawmakers across this country who have already been on a rampage um, passing laws to harm the LGBTQ community. In the aftermath of the Obergefell decision, we saw states try to reassert their bans on marriage equality. We saw them try to chip away at what a marriage actually means um, and the rights and benefits and obligations that people are entitled to. We expect to see this redoubled as state legislatures come into session next year. Um, they will leave no stone unturned in an effort to harm our community. I would also anticipate that there will be rogue actors, clerks that will refuse to issue marriage licenses, um, and government workers who won't want to give benefits to legally married same-sex couples. And of course, attacks on the trans community will continue as hotly as they have for the past several years. Now, that being said, it's not a guarantee that they will succeed. There are very good grounds on which we can argue that the LGBTQ decisions are different. Yes, they are substantive due process cases, but they also rely on an area of case law called equal protection. Because when it comes to marriage, when it comes to intimate relationships, um, the government was treating same-sex couples differently than opposite-sex couples. And by treating those couples differently, they were applying the law unequally or creating laws that mandated unequal treatment. So we will continue to use every tool that we have to make those arguments, um, to say uh, to the court and every single court in between um, that LGBTQ folks are entitled to full and equal protection of the law. And at no point should any rogue uh, actor, rogue lawmaker be allowed to upend our fundamental civil rights. With that, I'd love to turn it back to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, we really uh, value all of your incredible insights and we're thrilled to have you back again for a little bit at the end where we are gonna have some questions and answers. So thank you so much. Um, now I'm thrilled to get to introduce um, another incredible colleague at the Human Rights Campaign. Um, that's Carmarian D. Anderson Harvey. Um, as the Alabama State Director within HRC's Project One America, Carmarian is the first trans person of color to serve in a leadership role with HRC in the organization's history. Before joining HRC, Carmarian worked in the field of public health and education, managing both local and national prevention initiatives focusing on HIV AIDS and other health disparities that impact marginalized communities. Additionally, Carmarian serves as a member of the clergy and the Christian faith. Um, we're thrilled to have Carmarian as part of the team, and it is my pleasure to turn it over to her now. Carmarian, take it away. Thank you, Chris, so much. Um, and thank you, Joni and Sarah, uh, for setting um, the tone, uh, basically, of what I would like to offer and share. We understand that the overturn of Roe will be catastrophic for people across the country. And just like in the history of the United States, Black people and people of color are set to see the worst of this change. Black people have historically been disproportionately affected by abortion laws. Safe, 
accessible abortion have helped save the lives of people, specifically Black women, since Roe was enacted. But Black people are still vulnerable. Black people are more likely to live in a contraceptive de desert and less likely to have access to health care. Today, Black people are three to four times more likely to die from childbirth than their white counterparts. And we know that indigenous people and people from all kinds of marginalized racial backgrounds and disproportion represented in these statistics as well. This decision is another example of an attempt to revoke bodily autonomy from black people, indigenous people, people of color throughout the history of our country from its founding onward. We cannot ignore that these anti-abortion efforts have their roots in anti-blackness and racist ideologies. Nor can we ignore that our opponents are trying to stop black and brown people from fighting back as this attack and others by attacking our rights to vote. In addition, the overturn of Roe will have a devastating impact on the transgender community, my community, particularly transgender men and non-binary siblings. While significant shortcomings in data collection exist on the impact of reproductive restrictions has on the transgender non-binary community, as well as that the community collective use of assisted reproductive technology, we do not know that this decision is deeply dangerous for our community. Trans and non-binary people already face higher barriers when it comes to health care. In addition to structural and institutional barriers in access to care, many health care providers lack cultural competency, leading to worse health care outcomes. These disparities are compound for multiple marginalized folks. Did you know 30% of transgender people who had ever been pregnant had considered attempting to end their pregnancy by themselves without clinical supervision, self-managed abortions? Among one in five trans-identified individuals went through this attempt according to a research in 2019. More than one in 10 attempts self-managed abortion due to difficult situations such as fear of or ongoing intimate partner violence. Still, others were denied care due providers' opinions on either abortion or the patient's gender identity. In many areas of the South and Midwest, abortion clinics are often the only place low-income, uninsured people can go to get reproductive care including birth control and HIV services, prenatal and gender affirming care. Now many of those clinics are set to close. How many of those critical situations that you're listening to or maybe that you witness are set so close to home? As noted elsewhere, this was a coordinated, well-funded, five-decade effort by anti-abortion politicians to overturn Roe and strip people of the freedom of control their own bodies, their futures, their own lives. It's important of the same effort to strip away LGBTQ plus rights, particularly the rights of transgender and non-binary family and our voting rights. I will be remiss by being in Alabama and being part of a Southern ritual of understanding social justice that in rural South, those living in Southern states with the most restrictive laws will bear the blunt of the overturn of Roe. A disproportion of black women and girls live in these states. The most marginalized folks do all too often lack the ability to travel outside of the states for abortion. Since transgender folks and BIPOC folks disproportionately struggle with income inequality, it will be harder to afford travel outside the state, sometime across multiple states, to get to an abortion clinic. Also well, we are seeing the reality flash before our eyes. Trans-identified Black women, young girls, those with a womb, 
and in rural areas will be greatly impacted by this decision. I'd like to turn it back over to Chris. Thank you so much, Carmarian. Um, I want to just thank you for really being on the front lines with uh, so many other um, activists and, and folks out there around the country. Um, your voice is so important, and you just remind us with these startling statistics and really uh, shocking um, uh, realities that we all have to remain steadfast and continue this fight. So thank you so much, and we'll have you back again in just a little bit for our question and answers. You know, we have really incredible colleagues at HRC, um, and I'm thrilled to get to introduce um, one of them right now. Um, Jody Winterhoff is our Senior Vice President of Policy and Political Affairs. Um, and in that job, uh, Jody makes sure that we have the resources and the power um, and the influence to impact elections. And with the midterms just around the corner, um, we really wanted you to have a chance to hear from her about um, ways you can be involved and to hear a lot about what we're doing right now in this really important moment. Jody, take it away. Thank you, Chris. As Chris mentioned, my name is Jody Winterhoff and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm the Senior Vice President of Policy and Political Affairs at the Human Rights Campaign. So let me just hit a couple of highlights of what you heard from folks. You know, as Joni shared and as, as she made clear, we really are outraged. What has happened about basically taking access to abortion away from everybody in the country is just extraordinary. And as we think about where the country is today, you know, we need to really double down our efforts. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about tonight. You know, the Dobbs decision, uh, as has been shared, is doing real harm to women and LGBTQ people across the country right now. This case doesn't have the immediate impact on a Burgerfell or Lawrence from a legal perspective. But we do know that this decision is going to embolden our opponents to come after all of our hard won progress across the country. And so this is really a wake up call. And we've had a few of those in these last few years, but this is an extraordinary one. And it's time to get off the sidelines. Women are under attack. LGBTQ plus people are under attack. Our rights are being dismantled brick by brick. But we will fight back. Due to this country's legacy of racism and discrimination, you heard Carmarian share, you know, these barriers disproportionately harm Black, Latino, and Indigenous folks. And so as we think about those communities, in addition to and inclusive within the LGBTQ plus community, there are also people with disabilities, people who might live on lower incomes, and people who are in rural areas. There are multiple people who are going to feel this decision in a more intense way. And we need to rally our support in for all of our colleagues and our friends, our members and supporters, and those who need access to abortion all across this country. So states with more abortion restrictions have higher rates of maternal and infant mortality. And that also disproportionately impacts Black women and their families. And so there are multiple reasons that we need to step forward in this time. And there are tremendous harms that communities all across this country will feel. So we are in this fight to make sure everyone has the power to control their own bodies, their own lives, and their own futures. And we deserve elected officials at all levels of government and judges who believe that as well. We'll keep fighting in every state in this country until we have judges and elected officials who will show, show up for us in those ways. No judge, no politician, no ban should ever block our personal medical decisions or set the course for our life. These healthcare decisions should be made by the patient, their medical provider, if they want to rely on their faith and their faith leaders and their family, it's their choice, not the government. And so this is one of those key and critical times. And I just think, you know, this also is a reminder to us that elections do matter. Elections do have consequences because this happened over a period of time and highlighting this and planning for this happened over many decades, as you heard our speaker share. And so when we, we head into these electoral battlegrounds, we have a responsibility to ensure every member of our community, and especially those who navigate the world with multiple marginal identities, are represented in and served by our fight. And so we're going to approach this battle in that way. 
there are lots of folks who support equality across this country. And we ta have talked to you in the past about equality voters. So equality voters like you are the key to bridging this divide. The, there are 62 million LGBTQ plus, plus folks and our allies across the country. And we've been working to mobilize these folks for a long time. We consider you to be an equality voter. As we think about mobilizing you and so many other folks across the country, um, you know, we do know that our, our, our base and our folks that we're working with are motivated by these attacks on our rights, our right to privacy, our right to live our lives and, and plan for our futures. And as these judges and politicians strip these rights, we will fight back. We will work to change this trajectory in this country. In 2022, we continue to build our grassroots army. We have hundreds of volunteers, and by the time Election Day rolls around, thousands. But only if folks like you step up. We want to turn out a vote like never before, and we want your voices to be heard. And so as we're thinking about uh, the work that we have ahead, I want you to know that you're a change maker. You can be a change maker with your vote. You can be a change maker with your voice. You can be a change maker by volunteering and working to get other folks to the polls and by speaking out. And so if you will text outrage to 472-472, you can learn more. You can check your voter registration. You can sign up to be a volunteer. You can uh, plan uh, your volunteer schedule. You can do all of those things and see events that are near you. So text OUTRAGE to 472-472. And remember, we are change makers. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it back over to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Jody. Um, your insights are always so powerful and important, and uh, we really appreciate your leadership. Now it's my pleasure to bring back Joni Madison, Carmarian D. Anderson Harvey, and Sarah Warbelo for our question and answer section um, of the program. So we've actually assembled a really great uh, collection of questions uh, from things we're hearing from our members and supporters all around the country. And, you know, we're calling this our summer of outrage. And for those of you who are uh, involved in our work, you are going to be receiving a lot of information from us about ways you can be involved and ways you can be engaged. Um, uh, one of the key questions for those of you who've been paying attention out in the world um, revolves uh, some comments from Senator Ted Cruz, um, who stated that he believed the U.S. Supreme Court was was clearly wrong, quote unquote, in its landmark 2015 Obergefell v. Hodges ruling, the ruling that provided marriage equality across the land. Um, can we expect more politicians to come out um, in support of over key, overturning key rulings like this and others? And what can we do about it? Um, listen, there's no doubt that enemies like Ted Cruz have been emboldened by the reversal of Roe versus Wade. And yes, we do know that more and more politicians who have been um, standing on uh, foundationally on anti-LGBTQ rhetoric are going to come at us and uh, with more fever. And um, but I just want to remind everybody that, you know, the key to what happened in Roe versus Way really is that Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion, which agrees with the majority decision to overturn Roe. And he said that the court should reconsider other cases, including Lawrence, Obergefell, and Griswold, which grants access to birth control. And through his opinion, though, and he was the only one with this opinion, he was telling anti-state lawmakers, pandering to their base to test the limits of court-recognized LGBTQ equality. He also was waving a flag saying, if you feel like you can bring me a case, bring it to me at the Supreme Court level, and we'll see what happens. So, of course, we're very, very concerned, but I do want to reiterate that um, Obergefell and Lawrence and Griswold are still in time, and I'll, I'm sure uh, Sarah Warvelo will reiterate that. But let, it, let us be clear, we're not going to go backwards, and we're not going to let a small group of radicals dictate control over our health care bodily autonomy, and the right to make informed personal decisions for ourselves and our families. Thanks so much, Joni. Um, I really appreciate that. Sarah, I don't know if there's anything you want to add here. Um, I'm not calling you out specifically, but um, if there's anything else you wanted to include, we'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Uh, Joni covered it excellently. The only little thing I would uh, remind folks is, well, it's always important to protect your family and take legal steps that you can that are right for you. Um, there is no reason to rush down the aisle. Um, always make sure that it is um, something that is uh, right for your circumstances. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so Sarah, I have a question for you, and then I actually want to um, invite Carmarian back again to reiterate some of the things she shared as well. And the question really is, um, uh, what should I do if I'm part of the LGBTQ plus uh, community and still need an abortion? And then Carmarian, I'd love for you to come back and really talk a little bit more about what it's like in states that are incredibly restrictive and what, um, what services may be available. But also how people are coping, because I think it's really for our audience to hear one more time. So Sarah, why don't you um, take the first part of that question? Yeah, so the legal landscape on abortion access is shifting swiftly. Um, there were more than a dozen states that had trigger laws in place, which meant in the immediate aftermath of the Dobbs decision, um, abortion care became um, highly restrictive, very difficult to access or nearly impossible to access in those particular states. And we are expecting state legislatures, some to come back um, as early uh, as the next couple of months of this summer um, to enact additional restrictions on abortion uh, in many states. So first and foremost, um, we really encourage people uh, as soon as they know uh, that they are pregnant, um, and this may be uh, a pregnancy that they are unable uh, to keep, um, to look and see what the laws in their states are. Many states will continue to have um, access to abortion services. And so if you are in one of those states um, where you cannot access abortion, you may be able to travel elsewhere. There are funds that have already been set up um, to help folks uh, travel. And I would encourage um, you know, to look at places like a Planned Parenthood, um, which have historically um, trained um, their staff uh, to be gender affirming um, and to have base knowledge of the LGBTQ community. It's going to make for a better experience. Thank you, Sarah. Carmarian, do you want to jump in here and uh, you know add anything? But also, I'd love you to reiterate what you were sharing about the plight of so many people um, in the South. Yeah, absolutely. So what we have seen, um, certainly in the deep south, you know, stretching from really Texas all the way over to Florida um, and primarily those deep southern states like Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama, um, you know, th they are terrified. Um, but at the same time, um, they have mobilized in a way to ensure that they are remaining in community and of support. One of the things that um, Sarah lifted up is, is there are funds being collected, um, especially here in the South, um, which are being prioritized based off those that will be greater impacted, such as I stated, the black and brown community, our trans identified community, um, to ensure that um, if a decision is being made um, and their state in the deep South uh, has restricted abortion, then they will then um, use those funds and services to support um, those residents. Um, you know, Sarah also mentioned Planned Parenthood and here in the Deep South, Planned Parenthood Southeast is on the front line with HRC in addition to Yellow Hammer Fund and as well um, a Black Reproductive Sexual Health Clinic, um, Clinic 652, as well as Margins. I lift those names up because what these organizations have done since they no longer can offer direct services, since abortion is now illegal, they are now have become the referral source to ensure that they're becoming case managers for these individuals that need the assistance, um, that need the travel, that needs the mental health, the brain health counseling um, to be supportive um, for those in the Deep South. And I think the final piece is, is that here in the Deep South, we have found a lot of religion and faith spaces to also be of support of those individuals who have choices of their own body. And so that's important for the Deep South, since we are the Bible Belt state, that there are other intersectional institutions that are partnering with reproductive justice organizations and institutions like HRC and the ones I've mentioned to ensure that there is a holistic and equitable way to serve all residents who are being impacted by this decision. Thanks, Carmarian. Um, so I have a, a question for Sarah, um, which I think is a really interesting one that impacts uh, so many people 
um, and a lot in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, why are people saying that the Dobbs decision um, could limit access to IVF treatments? Um, and what's the connection there? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the ways that IVF works um, is to create embryos that exist outside of the body. And typically speaking, um, in order to achieve a successful pregnancy, as a result of IVF, doctors will create um, multiple embryos. Um, some of which may not uh, be capable of surviving, um, but others that potentially could be. And often it's really hard to tell um, uh, at that stage whether or not um, they are could successfully uh, come to term if they were implanted in a person's body. Um, and because so many um, of these lawmakers uh, believe that birth begins at conception, so that very early stage, um, getting rid of those embryos would be considered an abortion. Um, but it really isn't feasible to only create one and put it in a person's body. Um, it's expensive. Um, it is is sets people up for failure. Um, and so that's why there's a real concern that lawmakers may go after IVF, as well as forms of birth control, such as IUDs and the morning after pill, um, that some have incorrectly, um, unscientifically labeled um, as abortifacients. Wow. Um... Sarah, thank you. Um, we really appreciate that insight. Um, and it's just, once again, um, it's so important that we really think about all these issues holistically and how we are all interconnected and how all of these things impact us. And that leads me to our last question, which is, um, we know the Dobbs decision, um, the decision that takes away the fundamental right to an abortion in this country um, is not popular. And yet, here we are. So my question for you, Joni, is um, how is it that in this country um, we can have laws that are go against the will of the people um, and are still implemented? And what can we do as um, supporters of HRC to make sure these things don't happen going forward? Well, I know that everybody um, is a little fatigued hearing that um, it is about making sure that we continue to get out the vote, um, that we're voting the fair-minded elected officials who really represent our interest and the interest of a majority of Americans um, in our Congress and uh, houses of representative all across the country. Um, we really have, um, have in certain areas of um, a extreme and radical agenda that really it led all the way up to what was the reversal of a 50 year standing decision that the Supreme Court made. And it really is about taking back our voice and taking our, back our power through the electoral process. And every single election matters. Um, we certainly are very keenly focused on the midterms and Congress and the Senate, but it also is those state le legislatives. Um, it is who is representing you in your states and whose voice are they really, really um, uh, voicing uh, when these key decisions on legislation are happening. Um, I also would say that it also is about taking to the streets and making sure that our voice uh, comes together in unison and in coalition. Um, it really is when we unite and we unite consistently that we're hard to deny across the nation. So these things really do matter. And I know that people feel overwhelmed and daunted and exhausted sometimes, but I do know that we, we must find a way to re-engage, recommit and make sure that uh, we're showing up with our voice. And uh, I'm just very mindful of my young nieces and nephews who are really going to be impacted uh, for who knows how long in their life by these type of decisions. And I'm just adamantly determined as their aunt and hopefully uh, someone that they can trust will vocalize their rights uh, for the future generations. It's just so important. Thanks so much, Joni. Um, you know, this feels like a rational conversation, but I just want to remind everybody, we're outraged. This is unacceptable and we are angry and we need your help. Carmarian is there in Alabama fighting away every single day against horrific attacks. People all over this country are afraid 
and we need people to be engaged and outraged at this moment. Um, so I hope you will remain involved in our work. I hope you will actually text outrage to 472472 to find out more about how you can be involved in the human rights campaign and how you can help us. Um, and we hope you'll remain vigilant, engaged, and continue the fight for equality. Thank you so much for being with us. Look for more calls like this um, throughout the summer and well into the fall as we look for one of the most important election cycles in the history of our country. Thank you so much.